Welcome to your College Bound Kid. Podcast for parents and families everywhere. Whether you have kids that plan to attend college or you have current college students, you want them in and you want them to graduate. And you want a quality education that leads to job opportunities that you wouldn't have if you went from high school straight to the workforce. I am Mark Stucker, and I am a college coach. And I am Anika Madden, and I am a parent. It is Thursday, February 14th, and welcome to episode number 55, 15 Different Ways to Apply to College. In this week's news, parenting the college admission applicant as an admission dean. And we're in chapter 55 of 171 Answers, and we're talking through the 15 different ways that your kid can apply to college. And we have a special part two from the listener's question last week on satisfactory academic progress. And Mark is going to share 13 questions that you want to have answered when looking at your school's SAP policies. And this week's interview is with a special guest, Dr. David Williams. So you want to be a doctor or a nurse? What you need to know. So Anika, you, do you remember when we first started this podcast and we came on and we talked about what our New Year's resolutions were and we talked about getting in shape and losing weight? You remember that? <laughs> <laughs> I know, but I'm sure we talked about losing weight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And running and everything. Well, we never got back and gave updates. So that, you know, so I think that was intentional. But <laughs> notice, this, notice this year we didn't do New Year's resolutions. Mm-hmm. We didn't do that. But I want to share something else with I think our listeners will like. I came across it. I thought it was fascinating. Instead of resolutions, it's actually regrets. Oh. And so what happened? <laughs> yeah. So what happened is um Cornell University commissioned a study, they call it the Legacy Project, and they surveyed 1,565-year-olds. And they basically asked them, if you could start life all over again, what would you do differently? So it's really, I've been thinking a lot about this. So what I think I want to do for the next eight weeks is share with you the regrets from eight all the way down to one and get a quick quick comment from you. (laughs) Okay. So number eight. Not taking care of the B-O-D-Y. Any thoughts? (laughs) (laughs) On you not taking care of your (laughs) B-O-D-Y? Not really, but I get it. (laughs) You know what? I will say this because I know what all eight of them are. This is the biggest one for me. I've kind of slacked off a little bit over the years, but this is my year, Nika. I am (laughs) determined to get back to that. You know, I ran track at Michigan State. (laughs) No, I did not know that. Mark. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Many years ago. (laughs) That's awesome. Well, my regret is I regret all those New Year's resolutions I made in the past. So how about that? (laughs) (laughs) There we go. But let's everybody listeners, let's take care of our bodies this year in 2019. Let's turn to college hot topics in the news. All right. This week's article is from Mr. Brennan Barnard. He's written in the Forbes, and it's all about parenting the college admission applicant as an admission dean. So Brennan, Mark, as you know, is not just a director of college counseling, the college admission manager for Harvard Graduate School, a well-written columnist. And goodness, even a firefighter, volunteer firefighter. <laughs> so I thought was awesome. Uh, but he's also a parent of a teenage son getting ready to take, well, at the time of the, he wrote this, um, was it midsummer last year, that he was getting ready for his teenage son to take on the college admission process. So it was time for him to practice what he's been preaching, right? Uh-huh. So he admits to having thoughts of whether he would be miserable <laughs> you know, with his own family <laughs> you know, and, and going through this process and uh-huh. and what he would gain about both not just, you know, that process, but, you know, through his career, you know, through the, you know, the lens of, you know, going through this process uh, as not as a, in a professional role. So what he did in this article is that he asked other admission deans or I would say admission deans who recently parented a college applicant to reflect on what they learn and to offer advice. And uh, many of them, you know, just express appreciation of, of having a different viewpoint of having to do, you know, actually go through the personal experience. Uh-huh. So, you know, they talk about, you know, having to deal with their own child's procrastination and peer pressure and stress about testing and meeting deadlines. So, you know, these uh-huh. are the, the professionals having to go through it themselves. Uh-huh. And so he offers all these great anecdotes and they give all this great advice. And I'll tell you the thing that I really love about this article, Mark, is that it just reminded me as a parent that no one is perfect. No one, uh-huh. not even the, the not even the Mark Steckers of the world. <laughs> don't don't put me on that plane. 
<laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, Barbie, because you know you're going to have to answer. You know you're going to have to. I'm sure you resonated with this on all kinds of levels, being that Karis uh-huh. and Joy both went through the process. So absolutely, you're going to have to share with us, Mark, and the lessons you learned um, when you had to take your own professional hat off um, when going through the process. So what did you think? Ah, you did set me up, didn't you? There. Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, first of all, uh, for those of who, those of you who are new to our show, um, Brennan and I worked together. We uh, from two thousand one to two thousand four at the Westtown School. We kind of broke in. And we were newbies. We were green, um, and and we had him on episode thirty nine, forty, and forty one, where we talked about twenty common mistakes parents make. So you might want to go back and listen to that. Uh, we've got good feedback on that episode. But transitioning to this article, uh, one of the things I liked, he starts out by saying, how do dentists feel when they're at the dentist? He says, is it as miserable for, for, for them as it is for the rest of us? Or is it easier because they know the routine? So I thought that was a great way to start the article. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, as you said, Anika, you've got, he, he might have, must have interviewed 15 or 20 different admissions folks and asked them about their experience uh, to glean wisdom. And so what I did was I highlighted, like in big red, the the statements that different people said that I really identified with from my own experience. Uh, hmm, and so okay. I'll read those to you. So this is from Carrie Thompson, the Vice President of Enrollment and Communications and the Dean of Admissions at Rhodes College. Uh, and Carrie said, I did too much in some circumstances and too little in others. Finding the right balance was hard. and this, to me, was one of my two biggest takeaways as I reflected on my own experience with my two daughters, Karis 22, Joy 20. Um, it was so hard getting that balance, Anika, between we know that it's their experience. We know that we need to give them the freedom and the independence to, to own it, to be in the driver's seat with this thing, right? Um, and so that means sometimes letting them hit their head against the wall. But knowing the consequences, if you get, for example, a low grade in a s- academic solid class, like late 11th and 12th grade, that can ruin your opportunities at a school you're applying to. So to not intervene was really hard for me. That was hard getting that balance between how much do I just let them go, even if they're making a mistake, uh, versus intervene. So I found that part challenging. Um, some more Statements that other people said that I thought that I kind of related to. So this came from uh, Raul Fonts, the Dean of Admission and Financial Aid at Providence College. Raul, I've never met you, and I apologize if I butchered your name. But uh, (laughs) uh, R-A-U-L, Raul or Raul? So here's what he said. Um, It can be a wonderful experience, and some of my best conversations with my boys were on college road trips. And I definitely relate to that, Anika, because, you know, with Karis, uh, we went out to California at the end of her, between 10th and 11th grade. And that was an amazing trip. We visited Pomona. We visited Pitzer. We visited Scripps. We visited Claremont McKenna. We visited Occidental. We visited Pepperdine and, mm. and Whittier. Um, Boy, Karis did not like Whittier. But anyway, the other ones were <laughs> sorry, Whittier. She just didn't like it. It's not not saying it's a bad school. I know Nixon went there. No but, shade. But she Whittier. was not following Richard Nixon. She was not following Ooh. Nixon. Um, that was a nice town. But yeah, so so that was an amazing trip we talk about all the time. And then uh Joy, uh, we actually took an entire family trip with Joy. The trip with Karis was just with the two of us. We did an entire like nine day trip with Joy throughout all of Florida school. So that was awesome. So I related to that. Um, another statement in here, this is, comes from Deborah Johns, an associate director of undergraduate admission at Yale. Have tough conversations about what you can really afford and be very clear and consistent about this throughout visiting, applying and choosing institutions. I definitely did that. was absolutely clear up front. This is the budget. We went through a whole process and we're going to find colleges within this price point. Um, so that was really cool. And so those were some of the biggest ones that I, I related to. Uh, one other one, let your child pick for themselves and make them do the process on their own. Just consider the admission mm-hmm. process another part of your child's educational process, not a monolithic experience that you need to fight, game, or be stressed about. 
Uh, so, mm-hmm. you know, I, cause you know, I, you know what I believe, you know, my belief is not where you go is what you do when you get there and what you do when you get out of there. So I, I did okay. apply that, uh, to, to this whole process. Um, now there was, so Mark, yes, now Mark, go ahead, but go ahead. wait, 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 wait. Cause yep. you know, we're not letting you off this easy. I know. Because yes. Uh, and, and I remember the article, you know, goes through all the great things yep. and the, you know, they did all the things that they preached themselves. Mm-hmm. But tell us, did you, and maybe you didn't have this, but did yeah. you have a, did you have something that you would go back and say, you know what? I'm a professional in this and we did it this way, but you know what? I probably didn't do this the right way, or I could have tweaked this a little bit more or some lesson that you learn yourself. Yeah, definitely. Either, with either one of them. Did, did yeah. you have that experience? Yeah, I did. And that's actually a great question. Uh, I'm going to answer that now. And I was going to say something else, but I'm answering your question. Well, so, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, you're emphasizing all of these things, right? With your working with your child. You know, your all the different components that we talked about in episode 16, like we t- went through like 32 different things to look for in a college. And of those 32, there's like eight or 10 really big ones that tend to be major factors that tend to influence, um, you know, whether or not a, a school is a match. And so one of those is selectivity, right? right? We thought lots of other things, right? There's There's location and there's distance from home and is the school strong in your major and what's the makeup of the student body and all kinds of different things costs you know you can go on and on about all the different factors people look at uh when they evaluate evaluate a school but i didn't put a, enough of an emphasis on selectivity with joy and i'll be really transparent with with you and nika and with our our our, our listing family here uh joy's thinking about transferring from valdosta Mm. Uh, she, mm. she is on honor roll and doing extremely well there, but she really would prefer to be around students more like her. And she's an extremely strong, like the school had all the other things that she wanted other than the selectivity piece. And I figured, okay, she can get in the advanced classes. She can go in the honors college. She can do all that. It offers so mm-hmm. many other things. Um, mm-hmm. but so that would be something that I would have emphasized, uh, more than I did because you know, it's turned out to be more of an issue than than I anticipated it being. So I'll stay tuned mm-hmm. and give you the update, whether or not she transfers or not. But she wants to make that decision in the next mm-hmm. uh, 60 days. Oh, good. Well, good for her that she's tackling it now and not waiting until the end to for any regrets. Right. Yeah. But there's one more thing I have to share before we move okay. on, because there's one thing that is not in here. That I would add if I like if I would have been interviewed. I would have said, recognize the way each of your child has a different personality and a different gift mix. So what Mm -hmm. happens is like you can go through this process with one child and think, oh, I got this. Right. And then you can be in for a total rude awakening with the second kid. So, for Mm -hmm. example, like with Karis, Karis, she was one of the simplest people for me to work with. Like I said, Karis, what are you looking for when it comes to school culture, size, location, distance from home, makeup of the student body, strength in your major, weather, competitiveness, all the different things, right? And she told me everything. And I said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll build your list of schools with all those things in mind. And then you can pick off the list. And she was like, dad, this is your area. Of course, I trust you. So then she, she told me what she wanted. I built the list. It was like the simplest process in the world. All right, now comes child number two. (laughs) (laughs) The 180 in your life. (laughs) And I tell Joy this, and my kids, they're so good because they don't mind me talking about them on the podcast. But Joy cares one of the easiest college process. Joy was one of the hardest for me (laughs) because she's feistier, first of all. And and Mm -hmm. I try to give her advice. You don't know everything. And then um, and it was and it was hard because just so I haven't really shared this before, but uh, my daughter is a big joy. Joy, it was a big time athlete. So like when she was in the seventh grade, she was on a AAU basketball team that was ranked second in the state of Georgia, and she was a starter. And seven seven players on the team right now are playing Division One, uh, but due to her not growing, um, and really not being as committed as them, and she broke her leg, uh, she ended up not having. She ended up having like lots of D two and D three options, but not D one. And so, but there was the culture in that environment. There's this culture, what I call D1 or bust, right? Like, oh, you're not going D1? Like, you loser? Like, they don't say that, but that's like the implication, right? And so mm-hmm. I could see that 
she was like a superstar in high school. I mean, her first high school game in eighth grade, they let her play up to the on, on ninth grade. They let her play JV on and her first game, she scored 37 points. That, you know, she wow. outscored the whole other team and they won 44, 28 and she scored 37. So she's used to being like a superstar. And I knew that mm-hmm. she wasn't going to get a lot of time on a D1 school. And I didn't think she would like that. So she ca- keeps wanting me to look at all these big time schools and I have to have some honest, transparent conversations like, Joy, I'm not going to whatever, California to look at that school. Like, you know, and so so then it's so you don't believe in me. So I had to deal with that, right? It was so mm-hmm. difficult. And it didn't help mm-hmm. because both her trainer and her high school coach said, she's a D1 player. So she's like, my coach believes in me, my trainer believes in me, and you don't. And, and so that was wow. just very, very, very difficult. So um, we're in a great place now. Believe it or not, she went all the way through the process, had offers, and decided not to play. But um, so that's one thing that I would add. Now, before we transition, Anika, you, you've got a kid that's been all the way through this, and you've got a second one, so I need you to at least give me, not me, our <laughs> listeners, one pearl of wisdom yourself. Uh, the per- I'm going to give you Carrie Thompson's pearl that you mentioned earlier at Rose College. Chill, it's going to be fine. <laughs> That's a good one. Because <laughs> my... Yes. Especially for you. Because your head is going to go... You're not the, you're not the chill... <laughs> you're, you're not usually the chill kind of person. <laughs> Miss Anika Perfectionist Madden over there. Ooh, I'm making my way toward it, I promise you. Hey, like you said before, <laughs> I'm just a mom on the struggle bus. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> On the struggle, struggle juggle bus. <laughs> we better end right there. <laughs> now it's time for our step by step walkthrough of the college admissions process. Okay, friends, we are up to 55th episode. It seems, Nanika, where did they go? How did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> did I that don't happen? Know. I'm just so glad we're out of test <laughs> test score and test prep questions. <laughs> so, I think you were about to pull out your little test prep hairs over there. I was. We had 17 <laughs> weeks in a row. We talked about some aspect of the test. So And darn it, it was all worth all it. All right, good. Thank you. <laughs> so for our first time listeners, I wrote a book called 171 Answers, and the book has 171 chapters. And what I do is I take a chapter for each of the most frequently asked questions that I get. And so this is a part of our podcast where we take a couple snippets from each of those chapters. And if you ever want to know what we're going to discuss in the future, you could just go to 171answers.com. And there's a big red tab that says, look what's inside the book. And you can see what's coming up from 56 all the way to 171. And you'll know what we'll be talking about for the next 100 and whatever that is, 116 weeks or whatever. Yeah, I did the math right there. Uh, but this chapter is called, What are the 15 Different Ways I Can Apply to College? So, Anika, obviously you've read the chapter. What are some of your takeaways? Mm-hmm. Well, of course, the start was, who knew <laughs> that there were that many? And it's funny, Mark, because I was as I was reading through the chapter and the list and the ways, I'm just like, as soon as my head starts spinning, I'm like, VIP admissions, wait, what? That's a thing? <laughs> and then just as my head starts spinning, you, you go... <laughs> You politely write, your head may already be spinning from all of these methods. And I'm just like, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's crazy. It's amazing. Like, who knew? And I'm definitely not going to, I'm going to let you tap through, you know, through the ones I'm sure that you want to highlight through this. But, I mean, VIP admissions, like, what? What is that? Mark, tell us what's going on here. Well, the, I think that the reason that may be confusing for you, Nika, is because there's so many names for it. Because we have talked about that mm-hmm. before in the podcast. You know, uh, I... You know, those are like those uh, okay. snap apps. Some people call them fast apps, priority apps where, you know, where, uh, yeah, where you get something in the mail okay. and it says, you don't need to do an application fee. You're, you know, we've identified you as this outstanding student and you're op- eligible for $20,000, mm-hmm. no essay, just blah, 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 submit it. And, and remember, how, do you remember us talking about that? Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Cause those are appealing to people because they, they're kind of smart in a lot of ways because they appeal to people's sense of, uh, achievement and recognition because they're saying we've identified you. Then they mm-hmm. appeal to money, and then they're also convenient. Right. So, but let's not talk about that one because we've talked about it already. And I want to talk about rolling admissions because if you go back to episode four, uh, we did a real deep dive into the ten frequently asked questions about rolling admissions, and we talked about how it's different from early action there. Uh, but 
Let me ask you this. Were there any that you saw that you think, you know, I don't think we've talked about this on here in, in past episodes. Well, mm-hmm. I th- and, but to, to mm-hmm. your point you just made is that I feel like we have, mm-hmm. but all these darn mm-hmm. terms, like I want your college admissions world to come up with one <laughs> thesaurus, a dictionary or something. And just, <laughs> can we stick with that one, one, please? I mean, because if you think about deferred mm-hmm. admissions, um, late right. admissions, transfer right. admissions, you know, we've, we've talked about all that, but it's just, it's just very it's scientific, mm-hmm. right? They've got these very, you know, these terms attached to it that you may have realized that you did, um, didn't know anything about, but you actually did. So I feel like, um, yeah, I feel like, I don't know. You want to, you want to stick to the, oh, deferred admissions. Cause I know we talked about that one well, before, right? Yes, we, we have. In fact, Rick Clark came on an episode 49, uh, Georgia Tech's admission director. And we did a whole interview on deferred mm-hmm. and denials and how to handle it deferred. Um, in the book, I talk about two different types of deferreds. There's deferred when you apply ED or EA and, they want to compare you to other students that come in later in regular admissions. And so it's kind of like a wait and hold. Uh, We'll get back to you later as we evaluate your progress and we evaluate the other applicants that come in. And then there's the gap year. So the gap year is the second type. So and we have talked about that. We have some podcasts coming up talking about gap years. But so there are really two types of deferred admissions, right? There's what we think of as deferral Mm -hmm. from EA or ED to the regular round. And then there's a gap year. But there are a couple in here, Anika, that I don't remember right. us talking about. I think we've touched on. And I yeah, was go just going to say, early evaluation, we definitely yes. haven't talked on that. Yeah, you're on right. That. You're right. So um, what did you learn about anything? Did you learn anything uh, from what I said in the book about early evaluation? Well, I, no, let me let you let me let you define that because I did have to go back and stare at it, like because it is a lot. I know, like, I'm I know. serious. Like it's just like oh well, my god, and all these terms well, and everything. Well, just the so, word oh, early explain, is used like five times, right? There's early action, early right, action exactly. one, early action two, early decision one, early decision two, and then we've got early hey. evaluation, right? Actually, friends, there are not five ways of applying with the name early in it. There are six. I forgot restricted early action just now when I mentioned the other five methods of applying early. This is sometimes referred to by the acronym REA, and others call this single choice early action, which isn't a seventh early method of applying, but just another term for restricted early action. Here you apply early action, but there are some significant restrictions on what other schools you can apply to early if you want to apply to these schools. So you're preserving your ability to play the field and look around until May 1st, unlike early decision, but you sort of need to show your hand and let these schools know that they are more than likely your first choice. Before I say this, I want to say something because if I don't say now, I think I'll forget it. What I, one thing I do want to emphasize, friends, is that not every school has all 15. In fact, no school has all 15. Most, school will, most schools will pick somewhere between um, two to six of these methods that they will use. So that's important, right? So if, if you're looking at an individual school, then okay. you don't need to know like, okay, how are they using these diff- 15 and what terms are they using? Are they calling it VIP or SNAP or priority? <laughs> you know, are they going to call it EA or ED? No, you just need to know for most schools and be honest with you, it's normally closer to two than to six. It's rare that a school offers six, but some schools have six. Most of the schools offer like two, three, maybe four. So that's important. So let me say that. So so with early early evaluation is interesting cuz students apply through the regular admission round, right? So remember with regular admissions, if you apply in September or if you apply just before the deadline in January, the notification date is the same, right? <laughs> they they it's not like you hear earlier because you got your app in earlier like you do with with both rolling and early action or ED. But with mm-hmm. with early evaluation and very, very few schools do this, by the way. Uh, sometime, you know, maybe around late February, like right around now. Like I talked to this week, I talked to someone, Anika, that got an early notification. Um, Yale. Yeah, Yale was mm, doing okay. early notifications uh, some, some that were coming out this week. Um, what happens is you there's a, it, I, hate to, I hate to get more complex with this, Anika, but <laughs> there, there's a couple <laughs> There's a but couple of variations <laughs> of early evaluation, <laughs> you know. Yeah, there's the more yeah. formal version, which Wellesley College does, the Selective Women's College in Wellesley, Massachusetts, where Hillary Clinton went. They're going to let you know um, 
whether your admission is, is likely or, or possible, okay, or unlikely, okay? So, you know, and a final, final decision can come out later, but you kind of get tipped off um, early about what to expect. So that's the more formal process. That's not very common. What's more common is, and once again, admissions, we have to have all this vernacular, we have to do it. But you know what, then you can, every industry has it, like no matter what you're in, everybody's got their shop talk, right? They've, it's just true, like they all do. So right. what we normally call this is a wink letter. And, and, and it's a mm. wink letter, and it's just like it sounds. So it's a letter that will arrive, and it will say, after reviewing your application, we regard you as one of the more extraordinary applicants in our applicant pool this year. And we are very, very excited about the thought of you joining us in the fall. That's what we call a wink letter or an early evaluation. And what? And so let me ask you this question. Why would a school send a wink letter? We have no idea. Because to me, <laughs> I have no idea. Hey, that's, that's, <laughs> why are you that, taking me through all of no, this? That's, that's what good. I want to know. Honest answer. I have no idea. I'll tell you why. Because one of the most powerful things in admissions at yielding or rain, remember yielding, right? Yield. When I say yield, it's just the percentage of admits that, mm -hmm. that choose your school. So I'm going to use that term a lot, yield. Right. So one of the more powerful factors that determines your ability to yield an applicant is what, when I did admissions, we used to call it show them the love. You got to show applicants the love, you know? And there's lots of ways you can mm -hmm. show them the love. It can be through through your personal attention that you do, whether it's emailing or handwritten notes or calling, it's through um, some schools have these incredible acceptances that like personalize things. They pull things out of your application and say, when you wrote about this, we, uh, the, it really made you stand out in the committee and it's your, ex your dedication to your soccer team for four years. Like that's actually in the acceptance. So that's a way of should people make, it's basically making people, people feel special. When people are made to feel special, mm -hmm. you, they spike up in your mind. You spike up in their mind in terms of, ooh, mm -hmm. because everybody wants acceptance and everybody wants to feel like they're going into welcome, welcoming communities. That makes sense or not? Right. Oh, my gosh. Janaea, I told you, she's done it recently again mm -hmm. where she got some letter and they're like, oh, you're great. She's like, oh, but I need to go see these people. They said I was see? great. I was see? like, Janaea, please. <laughs> they, yes, I can easily relate to that. Now, easily. But I'm so glad you brought that up because here's where it can get confusing to people. Janaea is a junior. Mm -hmm. So what we, it's important to differentiate all the recruitment mail that you get as a junior that is doing the same thing, showing you the right. love, spiking interest, trying to get you to visit, trying to get you to apply. That is not a wink letter. A wink letter occurs after your application has been read. You see, right. that's a big right. difference. But it's the same concept in mm -hmm. terms of the motive. Well, that's yes. what I mean. The concept of the, of the kids really yes. feeling that love. Yes. Like, they automatically are like, oh, my God, thank you so much. Okay, I should love you back. No, you should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know what, Anika? Boy, I hate to get confusing. But there's actually a third type of deferred admissions I didn't even mention here. We've talked about it in the past. We did an episode on it. Here we talked about deferring from EA or ED to the regular round or gap year. Remember we did a whole in the news section on applicants being admitted in the spring instead of the fall? Yes, I do remember that. Mm -hmm. That's another type of deferral admissions. We'll offer you a spot if you come in the spring semester. So... Mm. So what are our takeaways for our, oh oh sorry before I ask you that I can't forget <laughs> I can't forget one that people miss all the time and it's so important. In fact, I'll say this. I did a first version of my book that came out in September of 2017 and then I didn't like the editing job that was done so I had to get it professionally edited all over again. And in the time I was professionally edited, of course, you know me, I've got my perfectionist tendencies too. I reread everything and I thought, oh, I want to change this. Oh, I want to change that. And one of the things I changed was I realized I left out a 15th type. The original book says 14 types. And the 15th is, and I almost left it out in this conversation, priority admissions. Mm. Oh my goodness. This is so important because what priority admissions is, is if you submit your application by this deadline, then you get special consideration for scholarship money. So I just had to get that in there. Oh, my so important. Gracious. And I will say this right now for you juniors and you parents of your juniors. Watch 
the deadlines. Watch the darn deadlines because I every yeah. year, you know, I like people to make a big master calendar and use an Excel spreadsheet of all your, you know, or if you want to do Word, I mean, whatever your system is, but have everything in one place. And I'm speaking to you, Anika, you've got a junior. Mm-hmm. You're going to put, I need, I need you to put together a master calendar with all these dates on it because every year and your state your state north carolina your new state Mm. is one of the worst ones they've got these really early priority (laughs) deadlines and so i have people say are you trying to people are like are you serious november 1st is too late i've lost the money yeah it was too late it needed to be in by october 15th oh yeah i know i know so what are the takeaways what are the takeaways the the takeaways are North Carolina residents, <laughs> get, get your doggone calendar and your, uh, it's funny, me and Janae, we had a little session a day over the phone and I was just trying to be as pleasant as I could, Mark. And, you know, she was in her little procrastination mode a couple of weeks ago and I'm kind of trying to feel her, you know, trying to move her out of that uh, or like ease her out of it. And she's doing a good job. She, I'm, I'm not going to complain about it. She's doing pretty good. But yeah, that's the biggest thing for me is watching those doggone deadlines for all of it. Like for anybody, mm-hmm. anywhere, all across the world, you just watch the dog on deadlines and well, know what, you like said you said, that. not all of them do the 15. Thank God. No, <laughs> so no, I don't know anybody know that does more than six, you know? But, yeah. But yeah. It's normally two to four. Now, Anika, I've been saying 15 ways to apply to college, but in reality, I'm kind of conflating some methods of applying with descriptions of the application process. For example, I list open admissions and late admissions as two methods. But you won't see schools say, let us know if you decide to apply through our open admissions or late admissions policy or process. An open admissions policy accepts any student with a diploma or a GED, and a late admissions school allows you to apply after May 1st. So technically, these are not methods of applying, but rather descriptions of their admissions policy. What's your big takeaway? Um, No, each yeah, no, know each school's different methods of applying. That's one takeaway. Make sure you understand what all 15 of these are and how they're different. Mm-hmm. And then know the deadlines. So those are my three takeaways. Okay. And to minimize the head spinning of our listening family, we're going to stop there. <laughs> yeah, because we got to talk about SAP, which is already a, you know, a lot of stuff. <laughs> glass of wine y'all we would like to thank all of our amazing listeners for your comments for sharing your stories and for the tremendous feedback on how our episodes have impacted your lives we are so humbled by you and we are 100 percent committed to helping fill the void in education around the college admissions process so now to help all set some of the considerable production costs for the show we are asking for your financial support We are very excited to introduce two very nominal levels of support that will allow us to remain commercial free and to meet the various expenses that it takes to produce this show. You can show your support by investing in either of our sustainer gift level, which is only $5 per month, or the enhancer gift level, which is only $10 a month. And if you would like to give a larger monthly gift or a one-time gift, you can absolutely do that as well. So at our $5 a month sustainer gift level, this is what you're going to get. We're going to recognize you for your support on our website and you'll receive an invitation to participate in a private group video college presentation that will happen in the month of January. And we're going to mail you two beautiful Your College Bound Kit notebooks, one for you and one for your student. And for our $10 a month enhancer gift level supporters, you're going to get all of that at the sustainer plan level. In addition to a 30 minute private one on one video college session with Mark on any admissions topic that you would like to cover. And also an amazing opportunity for a 100 word shout out on the show to recognize the hard, hard work of your student. It's so easy to support the show. Just go to yourcollegeboundkid.com and select donate from our website menu. Again, we thank you so much for your support and we deeply appreciate any and all gifts that will allow us to keep going commercial free. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, Mark, 
Last week, uh, one of our anonymous awesome listeners asked about SAP, which is Satisfactory Academic Progress. And thanks to you, Mark, we now know that every school has their own SAP policy, which has everything to do with uh, basically a performance accountability that will allow students to keep their financial aid. So, Mark, in your comprehensive, awesome nature, um, you want to share with us 13 questions that we want to have answered or definitely should have answered when we're looking at these schools' SAP policies. Did, did I, I dive on a, you? A, a dose of sarcasm with your comprehensive <laughs> nature there? Was that a little? Because <laughs> you're going to no, kill it me. Was a, it was a sarcastic compliment. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll focus on the compliment part. But you're going to kill me. But of course, you know, I had a week to think about it from last week. So, you know, I just, you know, I, you know, I added a 14th as I thought about and it. I'm going to say, did it jump to 31? No. <laughs> no, no, only 14. <laughs> only 14. So, okay, what I'm we'll going to do, that. what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share seven and then real quickly, and then I'm going to ask you if you have any thoughts on the seven and then okay. I'll share the last seven. Uh, but one go. thing I do want to say is, Friends, if you're listening to this episode 55 and you didn't hear 54, you really need to go back and hear 54 because we're not going to repeat uh, all the stuff we talked about because we had, I think it was like a 17-minute conversation on satisfactory academic progress last week. So we are going to assume that you heard that and you know what we're talking about. So what we're talking about in part two of this, because Anika has helped me to not do information overload on folk, is, <laughs> I mean that, I mean, that's a compliment. Is okay. <laughs> yeah. The, so what we're talking about today are questions that you need to ask your own school about their SAP, which is just an acronym for Satisfactory Academic Progress. What about their policy? These are things that can vary from school to school. So these are basically fourteen things you should know about your policy. Is another way of putting it. And I do want to say this. Fortunately, Satisfactory Academic Progress is not something that where the standards are set extremely high, right? Like you're not going to find a school that has a, uh, a SAP policy that says, if you don't graduate in four and a half years, time to bounce, you're out. You're not going to see a school that says, if you don't have a 3.75, hit the road, dude, you lose your money. You're not going to find that. Um, where you will sometimes see this, and this is very important before I get into these 14 points, is merit scholarship retention. And I do not want people to confuse satisfactory academic progress with merit scholarship mm. retention. If you're getting a merit scholarship, you do need to know what the GPA is in order for you to retain that merit scholarship. And I have seen some merit scholarships, Anika, that have policies as high as you need a 375 to keep that puppy. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you got to know that. So that's completely different. It's still money, but we're not talking about that. That's a whole, we'll get to merit scholarships later. If not, not this podcast, though. Not this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's dive in. Let's dive in. So first, what is the minimum GPA? Okay, what, mm -hmm. what is the grade point average that you need to have in order to keep your money and not lose your money? Very important. And how is that GPA calculated? And some things on that you should know is that it can vary from undergrad to grad. It can vary from law school, professional school. Uh, most of the time, there's no rounding up. Okay, it is what it is. If you're one one hundredth off, sorry, you just lost the moolah. Mm. And wow. state aid can be different from federal aid. And when I talk about federal aid, I'm talking about Pell Grant, work study, FSCOG, and federal loans, loans and grants. So that's the first thing. Know the know the GPA requirements. Secondly, if you're transferring in, how do transferred classes that are coming in impact the SAP GPA. So this is an area where schools have different policies. Third thing, if you remember from last week, one of the things involved in all SAP policies are what's, is what is referred to as PACE um, or PACE of completion or completion rate. Okay. Now, and basically it's just a formula, which is your class is attempted versus your class is completed. Right. And so a very common, um, a very, very common uh, PACE completion rate requirement is 67%. So what is the pace or completion rate? Is it 70%? Is it 67%? Is it 60%? Is it 75%? What is the pace or completion rate? Very important to know that. Fourth, what is the withdrawal date? And when I say withdrawal date, what I mean by that is what is the day that if you drop out of a class, 
is going to count against your pace of completion, right? So it's going to be factored into that formula of classes attempted versus classes complete completed. Because, you know, most schools have like drop ad periods where you can drop a class, you can try it for a while. And if you're not, it's not working, you can drop out. But what is the withdraw date where if you stay in the class past this, it's going to ca- count against your pace of completion. Um, you know what? I'm going to stop there. That's only four. But I want to I want to hear your thoughts mm-hmm. for the through the first four rather than through the seven. What do you think? Well, according to my little uh, handy dandy notes here, it's all clear. Oh. Um, so I think keep going. Okay. All right. I'll keep humming. Yeah. I'll keep us keep a truck in here. All right. So number five. <laughs> How do classes that were transferred in impact pace of progression? So we mentioned earlier how do transfer classes impact GPA. That was our second point. But you may recall from last week, there are three components to satisfactory academic progress. There's the minimum GPA, there's the pace of progression, and then there's what's called maximum time frame. So how do transferred in classes impact pace of progression? And then the sixth thing is, what is the maximum time frame to graduation? So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's not the same for everybody. We say time frame is a part of it. Uh, and, and remember, this has to do with the fact that if we're going to invest in you as taxpayers, you need to show that you're taking your academics seriously or you're not going to basically spend our money on you. So, right. so that would be number six. And then the seventh thing I wrote down here is, Um, how are makeup or do-over classes factored into your GPA? Uh, So what I'm talking about here, Mm. Anika, is let's say, um, I'll use Joy this time, but, you know, fortunately she hasn't had any low grades, but let's say Joy failed a class, okay? And then let's say she retook the class. When she retakes that class, let's say she goes from an F to a B, okay? Mm-hmm. When she retakes the class, does the B erase the F, or does the F, is the F still factored into the GPA? Make, does that make sense? In other words, is it, is it, is it combined? Yeah. All right. So any, any thoughts on, uh, I shared three more. Any thoughts on any of those? Nope. I think we're still good. We're still good? Mm-hmm. So I, I want to say, I want to, I want to add a thought. I want to get away from these last, uh, you know, five or six points for a sec. So there can be a listener out there and they can be thinking, you know what? My kid is not going to have a low GPA. So I don't really think this SAP stuff applies to them, or they're not going to take forever to graduate, or they're going to complete most of the classes that they attempt. So I'm not really worried about this. What I would say to you, if that's, you know, if that's uh, describing you is one of their friends or someone else you may know may not be in that situation. So it's still helpful information for you to help others. Okay, Anika, we're humming along nicely here. And the eighth question that every student should ask to better understand their satisfactory academic progress policy is how do incomplete classes factor into the pace of progression. Um, is that clear? Or should I say more on that? Uh, say a little more on that. So remember, pace of progression is a formula, right? One of the three things that is used to determine whether or not you're in compliance with SAP. And it has to, pace of progression has to do with, uh, it's just a mathematical formula. So if you attempt 100, how many do you complete? And schools set their own standards for what is an uh, acceptable pace of progression. So a very common one is two thirds. I see that a lot. So for example, if you attempt 100 credit hours, do you complete 67 or more to be in compliance? So an incomplete class, of course, has to do with you take a class, but you don't finish it for, for whatever reason. You know, you don't mm-hmm. complete it. It's not mm-hmm. a failure. And it's not even a withdrawal. And right. so the question is, how are incompletes factored into that formula? Gotcha. That, okay. You got yeah. it? Clear. All right. Keep humming. All Keep right. humming. Number nine. How are audit classes factored in pace of progression? So oh. some, you, you know, so some schools will count an audit against you. You know how you can, you, I don't know, you know, I don't know. Have you ever audited a class, Anika? I have not. I've known people to do it. Um, and I don't totally understand it. So I think it's worth explaining it, Mark. <laughs> so I did it in grad school. So when you audit a class, you get, you have permission to be in the class. Right. But you have no responsibility at all to turn in any of the work. It's like yeah, you're right. a that's silent right. listener mm-hmm. and you're absorbing everything. 
And so there are schools that will count an audited class against your pace of progression. And if someone's into taking a lot of audited classes, that's something you're going to want to know. Hmm, okay. um, number 10, how are classes you withdraw from factored into pace of progression? Okay. So before we talked about you want to know the withdraw date, right? Mm -hmm. What's the date? But how are they factored in? So that's 10. And then 11 would be how does changing your major impact um, SAP, because uh, there are that's a big one. Yeah, but, well, because there are schools that one, they might have a different SAP policy for different majors, but also there are schools that will cut you some grace. If you were, let's say, you were really struggling as a pre med or an engineering student, now you switch. Um, does that sort of reset or recalibrate things, or is it, hey, tough noogies? Like you should have known that before you, <laughs> <laughs> you know, before you took those classes, you should have known yourself better. You know, so you right. So that's number 11. Any, any thoughts on any of the last? Uh, yes, we banged through four right quickly there. No, those are good. Keep rolling. All right. And then 12 would be how often does your school's financial aid office evaluate your progress? So is mm. this done every semester on your trimesters or quarter system? Is it done then? Is it done once a year? Like what's the, the frequency by which you are being assessed? You know? Right. And then 13 is... Uh, what will happen if you fail to make satisfactory academic progress when your school evaluates you? So uh, what what happens? Like, is there a warning? So in other words, some schools have a whole system, like the first time you get a warning, and then the next time you lose your money, and then other schools, mm -hmm. like first time you found out that you're told you're not in compliance and you lose your money, you know, and then, right. and then a school can right. have like a couple warnings. So what's the process? What what are the steps involved, you know, when you notify it, are you losing mm -hmm. it or is it like some kind of probation or warning system? You know, Got it. that's it. And then the last one, number 14, is it really has to do with uh, what is their notification method? OK, mm -hmm. and, and there's a couple components to this. One is something you brought up last week, which is how does a school even let people even know what SAP is? Like, is it part of freshman ori right. orientation? Is it sent home? Um, you know, in some type of mail literature, um, mm -hmm. you know, is it posted in a portal? You know, is it is, is it responsible of an advisor? Like, how do they initially even communicate to you, one, what their policy is, two, where you find it, you mm -hmm. know? And the second mm -hmm. component of this is how are they going to notify you if you're in danger? Like, is that through right. email or is that through email and portal? You know what? So that, that's, that's it. So what do you think? And the well, that notification, you know, is huge with me. And huh? as a parent, I want to know, too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you get into college, it's all about, oh, the kids, <laughs> they don't have to tell you everything, even though you're paying all the bills. <laughs> so that would be my primary Her question mom. is, are you just notifying Jalen or are you telling me as well? <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. And normally on this kind of stuff, you know, if the student gives you permission to have access to all the academic stuff, you should be getting emails. But not if it's being told, you know, through an advisor or through a group meeting with students or through a freshman orientation, you know, depends what right. the no notification method is. Uh, you know what I'm thinking right now? I'm sapped out. <laughs> Just like I did, <laughs> I did a two-parter on sap. I'm, I was test prepped out. Now I'm sapped out. Well, I want to be sap free, Jamea and John. That's better. <laughs> yeah, you know what, though? Sometimes when we talk about this, we think, well, you know, probably because a lot of times, just being honest, a very common standard on the GPA side is is uh, 2.0. And, mm -hmm. and like I said, a very common pace of progression is 67 percent. A very common um, longevity or length of time is 50 percent more than the length of the program. Six years, right. if it's four years or 100 attempted, 180 attempted credit hours out of 120 to, to completion. But. 10% of students in Nika have less than a 2.0. That's, that's yeah, high. Yeah, you said that. So, that's, that's pretty alarming. Yeah, so, so basically, you know, around 10% of people are probably losing or not being in compliance with SAP at some point. So it is, it is something that I want to get the word out on. But I'm ready to move on to our, <laughs> our interview and then next week's review preview. <laughs> moving on, moving on. <laughs> Okay, friends, I am so excited uh, to bring you a lifetime friend. We've called each other cousins. We're really as close as brothers. I think you're really, really going to enjoy uh, what Dr. David Williams is going to share with you as he talks about opportunities in healthcare careers, particularly 
being a doctor, being a nurse, and being a physician assistant. And what he had to say was so good that we're going to split it up and divide it up over the next four episodes. So um, listen and enjoy my lifetime friend and brother, Dr. David Williams. And now, this week's interview with a special guest. I'm here with Dr. Williams from Chicago, Illinois. Welcome to the Your College Bound Kid podcast, Dr. Williams. Welcome, my very, very good friend, soul brother, and brother by another mother, Mark Stucker. <laughs> <laughs> and for those of you who are wondering, wow, that interview was really, really casual early. So I, that's the only time he's getting called Dr. Williams. He knows I never call him that. <laughs> that's right. The truth of the matter is that our dads knew each other growing up. They still, they're, they have like a 70 plus year friendship. And we've known our, each other our whole lives. We spent Thanksgiving, Christmas, traveled together, you name it. Uh, we're as close to being brothers as you could be. You could learn up and call each other cousins. And I had the privilege of working with uh, Dave's daughter through the college process. And super, super excited to have you here today, Dave. So thanks for, thanks for coming on here. That's right. We've we've shared beds and sleeping bags at various <laughs> homes and camps throughout our lives. Yes, <laughs> yes. We used to go to summer camp together every summer, but we won't we won't talk about that. That's 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 too much information. TMI, as they say, TMI. <laughs> but you can edit that. <laughs> there you go. But Dave, why don't you give us a little mini bio? Uh, walk us through from you know growing up um, all the way through undergrad, grad, and and some career choices. So you know, take yeah. take uh, three to five minutes and and. Uh, Give our listeners a little bit about your background. Well, I was born in Montreal, Canada. I had a wonderful father and mother who came from the Caribbean. Um, my father actually was, I think, the third African-American that was accepted into McGill Medical School back in the 1950s and began his medical career first in Montreal and then later in Toronto and became a family practitioner, and a surgeon. So he was truly my inspiration for getting into medicine. I was very privileged to get into Princeton University. And at that time, I was strongly thinking about medicine because my father, of course, set me on that path. But I also had a lot of other interests, including politics, uh, which Mark knows very well. <laughs> and one of the best advices I ever got way back when was, study your passion and study what you love. And then make your profession suitable to your passion. Uh -huh. And uh, the other advice my advisor said is, once you take your pre-medical prerequisites, study, use the opportunity to take the major that most interests you. Because, the, because at the time you apply to medical school, they'll be far more interested in an English major with passion than someone who just took biochemistry because he was fulfilling a pre-medical prerequisite. And that was a fantastic uh, advice. I had the opportunity at Princeton to get accepted into an undergraduate program called the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs and spent the last two years after my medical prerequisites were finished studying international politics and um, socioeconomic issues dealing with uh, relief and international health. And that culminated me spending about uh, four or five months in West Africa, in Niger, during the 1985 famine there. From there, I was accepted to Harvard Medical School, where I spent four years plus another year doing research, and eventually ended up in internal medicine after rejecting surgery. And then from internal medicine, I switched to emergency medicine, which I've been doing now for the last 20 years. So my life has taken a rather circuitous choice in terms of how I eventually ended up. But I've loved the journey. And once again, the journey was always motivated by what interested me and what my passions were. And so I think that's what was the guiding um, beacon in my career. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. So Dave, that, that was great. I'm going to ask you to, to fill in, add a little more color in there, fill in some details. Yeah. You, you kind of skipped the story about trying to trying to make Princess basketball team, so I need you to tell that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it was interesting. When we were growing up, you, you and I remember well that we all thought we were great athletes, and we all went to, I went to a relatively small private school, and we played basketball, and we were on track, and we always won a lot of Sportsman of the Year awards, 
And uh, I think we were unprepared for the level of competition that you have to undergo once you get into college. So at the time, I had a wonderful, renowned coach called Pete Carrill of the Princeton Tigers. He barely knew me by name, but knew me as this guy who was always there spending four or five hours a day trying to make the JV basketball team. <laughs> and then one day he pulls me to the side, and uh, you might have to edit it, this comment, but he says, what's your name, kid? And I said, my name's Dave Williams, sir. And he says, Williams, I love your spunk and your dedication, but you can't play where sh How'd you like to be the manager? <laughs> so from there, I realized that despite my abilities, uh, I was not going to be the next Golden State Warrior hero. Uh, the next... Uh, uh, the first couple of years of, of college were actually pretty rough because the other thing I realized was that uh, I wasn't quite as bright as I thought I was. You know, you go to high school and you might be the tops in math and science, uh, but when you went to college, you quickly realized that there were a whole lot of people a lot smarter than you in a lot of fields that you thought you were relatively strong at. And that's why I think the advice to Focus on your passion and focus on what you're good at was so helpful for me because rather than try and bang my head against the wall and excel in physics or math or biochemistry, fields in which I was competent but clearly not excelling by the end of my first year, I decided forget it. I love politics and a life of history and uh, I love economics and that's what I made my major. And as a result, not only did I have greater academic success, but I had a, a much greater sense of personal fulfillment because I felt that it was more true to my nature. And so I think one of the processes we all go through in college is finding our strengths and weaknesses. And, and don't be afraid to acknowledge what you may not be so good at and to recognize what you are gifted at and to pursue not just your passions, but your gifts, because that'll help you in your success later on. Yeah, and that's really great, great. And I'm going to come back to that in a second, but I want to fill in another chapter. Um, when you when you eventually came to the Chicago area, you you went ahead and got another degree. Talk about that degree, why you got it, um, and if if it's been helpful at all in your life. Well, after I finished my residency in emergency medicine, I noticed that there were a lot of changes that was occurring in medicine itself. One was the increased corporatization of medicine. The ways that we got employed back then and, and now was you could jo be, be part of an academic group, join a university, or you can join a big mega corporation that owned multiple car contracts, ER contracts, or you can join what we used to call single democratic groups. I know I'm getting a little bit in, in the weeds here, but those were uh, groups of uh, four, five, six, maybe 10 doctors who would get together, who would form a corporation and then would bid for uh, a contract with the hospital to try and provide them with emergency services. Because I recognized the need to um, be involved in much more management and, and business, I pursued a a master's of business, a business administration at Northwestern University and got that degree about three years out from my residency. And from there, I was able to parlay that into being a medical director for eight years at a hospital in Chicago and to do other business ventures. So it was just an example of how, as the field was changing, an MBA did help me to recognize some of the changes that was going on in the field and take advantage of them. Great. So, listeners, if you haven't figured this out yet, our, our subject for the day is called So You Want to Be a Doctor, because um, a lot of students do want to be doctors. And so I, I couldn't think of a better person to bring on uh, than my good friend to talk about this. And uh, his dear wife, uh, Dr. Frieda Williams, is also a doctor. Uh, so at the very end, Dave, I, I'm, I'm going to probably ask Frida to, to, to jump on and, and, and share what, what you missed out that you should have shared, <laughs> if, if, okay. if, if, if that's okay. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week.
The recommended resource for episode 55 is the classic book, The Fisk Guide to the College. If you only get one college guide, this should be it. I regard it as a must-have for your library. I'm actually shocked it took me until episode 55 to share this, but I thought I'd shared it before, and I was looking over past recommended resources, and I was a little flabbergasted to see No Fisk Guide to the College on the list. So the guide has great lists and things like uh, great schools for, you know, for your money and great colleges with support for learning disabilities and test optional colleges and excellent international colleges in Europe and Canada. Uh, but the meat of the guide are the 300 plus selective colleges that have detailed 1,000 to 2,500 descriptive essays of what it's like to actually be there. The strengths and the areas for improvement, both in terms of culture and in terms of academic programs. Uh, each write-up includes a really nice description and a rating of their academic climate, the makeup of the student body, and the social scene. While no guide is perfect, the majority of the time when I read a write-up from the Fisk Guide to the College, it is spot on with my own impression of a college, which for me is based on visiting the school, talking uh, with multiple admission officers, employees, and talking with numerous uh, current students and parents. So um, I recommend this book wholeheartedly and without reservation. I don't think you need to always have the current issue. They will talk about how each new each year they update it. Um, and so it makes it sound like if you have the 2018, you need to get the 2019 version. I find that they make very little changes from one edition to the next. As long as you're getting something within three years, uh, it should be really good. Uh, we'll now return to my interview with my dear friend, Dr. David Williams. So, so Dave, let, let's talk about right away. So what convinced you that being a doctor was for you? Well, it, it was actually a process. Uh, it's sort of tried to say you, you want to help people and make a difference. But I, I do think it does start from that basis that we all try, we all should try to think of ways that the world is warped, the world is broken, and how can we step in there and make a difference? And early on, my father provided a fantastic example. Uh, he came from a very small island in uh, the Caribbean, Tobago. Uh, he came into an immigrant community in Toronto. And he, at the time, provided health care for a group of people that were truly underserved. The immigrant communities coming from the Caribbean and from Italy and Portugal and Greece and he was quite a remarkable man. He actually spoke about four or five languages during the course of his practice. So I was able to see how one physician in a community could really impact that community and raise the standard of health care. So that's what attracted me initially. As I went to college, I realized that there were other global issues of health care uh, that dealt with uh, economic development in third world countries. And then in our own country, uh, the disparities between rich and poor and the fact that in the United States um, there were uh, there was health care that was really predicated on people's ability to have insurance and people's ability to have a job and that whole inner city and rural communities were without adequate health care because they didn't have ways to pay for them and there weren't health care providers in that field. So I was attracted to medicine for that reason and later to emergency medicine because it was one of the most effective ways of delivering primary health care to the inner city. Which is great. And, and um, you know, you mentioned what drove you into to medicine. What, what do you think about someone who says, the main reason I want to be a doctor is I want to make a lot of money? Is that a valid primary motive, in your opinion, or, or not? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, several thoughts. There's nothing wrong with acknowledging that medicine traditionally has provided a very good standard of living for people who pursue it. And if your motivation is to make a lot of money, certainly you can do so in medicine. I might caution you, or the person who thinks that way, however, that given the time investment involved in medicine, there are easier ways to make money. <laughs> so when you consider that medicine requires four years of an undergraduate degree, four years of a medical degree, a residency that can stretch anywhere from three to over 10 years, depending on the field that you go into, and another several years after that to get established in your uh, given field, and that 
at today's college and medical school prices, it may require a commitment exceeding um, uh, five hundred thousand plus dollars. Then most financial analysts would say that if you do other things like real estate or business or uh, X, Y, and Z, you could probably get a better return on your investment than pursuing medicine. So I would caution people to not look at medicine as a way to make money. And the other big cautionary note I would say is that medicine is changing incredibly rapidly. We have the forces of corporatization that is rapidly taking away a doctor's ability to be an independent player in the healthcare field. By that, I mean most doctors are coming out and they're salaried, and they are subject to forces of supply and demand, which means depending on their geography or their position, they may not make nearly as much money as they thought they'd make. The other issue is that there is the prospect of single-payer medicine. Our healthcare system is broken and it's failing, and many of the solutions purported may end up having a system where doctors make considerably less than they've made before in order to pay for the political changes that are coming to medicine. So we don't know where medicine is headed. And we don't know how much doctors are going to be continued to be reimbursed at the levels that they've been reimbursed in the past. So I would caution anybody who thinks that medicine is a pathway to riches, that that may not pan out as we go uh, forward in the future. So, so do you recommend that, that doctors develop uh, um, additional skills? I mean, it's always good, of course, to have multiple streams of income. I mean, what protections do you recommend for future doctors against changes that are somewhat unforeseen? Well, the first thing I would say is that if you are in high school or just getting, uh, getting into college, the changes that are going to occur are going to be so far out that you're not really going to be able to predict them because you're looking at trying to predict 15 years in the future, right? Mm -hmm. You can't do that when you're a high school student. You can't do that. And so any advice that says, you know, go into this particular field or develop these particular skill sets in order to preserve a level of income in the future is, is speculation at best. We don't know where the future's heading. So the best advice to give someone, especially at the high school level, is really follow your passion. Figure out what it is in life that you really care about, number one, and that you're good at, number two, and try the meld the two. And if it turns out that you think that you would love to go into medicine and the field in medicine that you're going to be good at is going to be surgery or gynecology or emergency medicine... Focus on pursuing that first and becoming the best that you can be. 10 years from now, 12 years from now, when you're in your residency, then you can start thinking about how can I take these skill sets that I've acquired and best maximize them given the changing landscape that we have today. I know that sounds very general. No, that's good. Next week in the news, 10 college majors with the biggest gender gap. And we'll be in chapter 56 of 171 Answers, and we'll be discussing the pros and cons of applying to a school through early decision. And it'll be that time again next week for our bonus content. And get ready for part two of Mark's interview with Dr. David Williams. So you want to be a doctor or a nurse? What you need to know. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. And if you found this podcast helpful, it would help us tremendously if you would subscribe and write us a review on your favorite podcast listening station. And please be sure to click the share button and send this to someone you know that could really use this information. Your College Bound Kid is produced by John Lockenball. The amazing music that you hear is by Victor Allen Weeks. Artwork is by Andrea Togo. And marketing designs are by Kimberly Blass. If you want to get a copy of the book, 171 Answers to the Most Asked College Admissions Questions, you can go right to 171answers.com. And if you want to have a college coaching session with Mark, you can send him a text to area code 404-664-4340. And if you have a question or a few questions that you would like for us to answer on the show, please email us at questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. That's questions with an S at yourcollegeboundkid.com. 
Every week, we'll take one question and include it in the episode. We don't like your questions. We love your questions. So send them our way. And by the way, check out our website, which is just simply yourcollegeboundkid.com. Again, we thank you for tuning in and we look forward to meeting with you again next week.